Okay, so um, we've officially begun. Uh, I started the uh, recording. Uh, so speaking of uh, reviews um, for the test, which is coming up next um, Tuesday, right? Um, I did post the, uh, well, I, I'd already posted, um, well, maybe they didn't turn on until yesterday. I'd already posted the um, uh, answers. So the solutions to the sample test are, uh, that link is now available on the class Blackboard page. And uh, and then there's now a, a link to a, rev, uh, a review video where I'm just going over some of the questions from the uh, review sheet. So that mm -hmm. is also now uh, live, okay, on the, uh, on the class Blackboard page. Um, and uh, so you guys can look at that and that will remain posted until the time of the test. And then I'll take it down temporarily while you're, taking the test and then uh, put it back up again later. But, um, and so speaking of the test, that is next Tuesday, right? So um, it will be posted immediately after class um, on Tuesday. So we'll have class on Tuesday, but also on Thursday. Uh, so this is a regular class week next week, but uh, uh, the test will be posted uh, right after class. And then um, uh, it will be due uh, to be emailed back to me uh, Thursday at 5 uh, p.m. So we still have class on Thursday. So I set the due date um, a few hours after uh, the class um, um, on Thursday. So you have a little bit over um, 48 hours there to, um, to you know, write out your answers and email them back to me, just like on test number one. So uh, the, the procedure is uh, exactly the same. Okay. So, uh, well, since we're still having class next Tuesday, I can still remind you that the test is going to be posted on Tuesday, but I'm sure everyone's aware of that. Yeah, Saad. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I, I was going to ask you, did you ever post the, the answers for the sample test? Yeah. I keep I, checking, but it's there. It's there now. It should be there. Okay. I, I checked it and uh, it, it uh, looked like it was, it was posted. Uh, shall test, we look for it? Test. Yes, uh, I found it. Okay, so yeah, it right. So, and then uh, above or below that is the link to the uh, is the the link to the video that just discusses some of the answers to those uh, questions. Now, what is not what I did not go over on that uh, review a uh, video is the differentiation questions. So, questions eight and nine on the sample test, and there are several parts to those questions eight and nine are just a bunch of uh, opportunities to differentiate functions. So it's just a bunch of uh, practice with differentiation. So I did not uh, on the video go through uh, any examples like those. There were far too many of those for me to go through every one of them anyway, but uh, the solutions are written out very carefully on the, on the solution sheet. The steps are written out very carefully um, and uh, so you should be able to follow those steps. Uh, but if you have questions about, uh, and you certainly might have questions about some of the steps in, um, in some of those differentiation problems in questions eight and nine, uh, that's a good opportunity to um, ask um, Madison on Monday. So again, she has a regular session on Monday at noon. And so you could, um, you could ask her Monday at noon on you know, well, I didn't understand some of the steps to, um, you know, some, uh, you know, finding this particular derivative, right, uh, on the uh, on the sample. So, um, of course, you can ask her other things uh, during that session as well, right? But uh, well, one thing in particular, since I did, didn't include those in the video, someone, did someone ask you something? Yes. Um, uh -huh. I had a question for Madison. Can I ask her right now? Sure. Yes. Uh, What's hey, up? Uh, I was trying to join your session earlier today, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's asked that I have to log into my uh, Zoom account that's mm -hmm. from UHD, but I wasn't oh, yeah. able to log in. Uh, like I tried my password, um, mm -hmm. I reset my password to see maybe if I was putting the password wrong, but it was mm -hmm. keep saying that I was I wasn't able to log in through oh, the okay. UHD. through UHD. Oh, yeah. Okay. Huh. How are so, you, but Saad, how are you? Look, how are you? How are you? Here. Yeah. This <laughs> one now? is my personal account that I use. Oh, but you, oh, well, you cannot use that also as long as you have the ID, right? Yes. Right. But 
when I try to join uh, her, uh, when I try to join her meeting using her, the number that's on the Blackboard, it says mm-hmm. that I have to be logged into my UHD Zoom account. So with the UHD Zoom account, uh, what you have to use is like um, your student ID. Here, I'll just use mine as like an example. Let me see. It wouldn't be the email address? It would be no, the it would ID? Be, yeah, it would be straight up like that. And the usual email and the usual password that you would use to sign into like, um, uh, like Blackboard or... Okay, okay. So just my mm-hmm. regular. Well, Saad, when you when you go to Zoom um, and and try to log on, make sh- for UHD. Make sure you um, isn't there a button, a, a little link at the bottom of right? Zoom yeah, it says SSO, SSO or something. Yeah, SSO yeah, yeah. Which is right single sign on. Right. Yeah. And then okay. and then the and and I think then the domain is UHD, and then it will let you log on. Okay. Got you. Thank you guys both. Yeah, no problem. Here, I'll go ahead and put in the link for the UHD Zoom. It's right here. This is where you'd go to sign in for uh, your UHD account on Zoom. Okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. So that's weird. I didn't... um, Hmm, that's strange. Uh, Yeah, there's like uh, different settings you can set on uh, your Zoom meetings. And that's that's something that's required for SIs. Because oh, we want to like, yeah, we want to avoid um, people who, because um, like, I mean, our services are only for UHD people. I we see. don't want people from outside and we don't want um, people who come in and like stream bomb and stuff like that. Oh, okay. I thought that, well, all right. Yeah, okay. So that's just a rule for the SIs. Okay, all right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> all right. So we don't have to get into why that's a rule. It's kind of, a, well, anyway, all right. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, so other questions? So well, so those are good. I learned something right there um, mm. that I didn't know. Uh, other things that y'all want to ask about the test and stuff. So I, I so I think all the links are working. So, um, um, so um, now if you find any, uh, you know, it's always possible that there are mistakes in the answers on the on the solution. So you know, if I'm if I, um, you know, if I made any mistakes, you can let me know that uh, you know some. And think I got one of the answers right, which is certainly possible. Um, okay, um, all right. So uh, on homeworks now. So that's really uh, all I have to say about the test. I think at the moment um, on homeworks, um, there's a homework due on. So it's an odd due date. So uh, it's on Saturday. So uh, it's on implicit differentiation. Uh, so try to try to do as much of that as possible by Saturday. I'll I'll think about if I want to change that back to Tuesday. It really. This is on the test, so we really don't need to have this homework done until Tuesday, but I set it to Saturday to try to uh, uh, get you to work on it and so that you would have time uh, before the test to study the sample test instead of just trying to finish this homework, okay? So, um, uh, and this is implicit differentiation, which is, you know, can be kind of complicated. So, um, so try to work on that and that'll be good practice for the test. These homeworks now are not due till uh, after the test, and uh, and these uh, these due dates are flexible. Also, we're going to talk about limits today. Uh, so you, the thing you should be thinking about before the test is not necessarily these homeworks, but preparing for the test, right? So you'll have a good score on the uh, uh, on the test. All right. Um, so that's just kind of the sequence of events here uh, up until. Uh, up until Tuesday. Um, everyone, uh, well, most people did the uh, uh, chain rule homework and did pretty good on that. So, so that's great. Um, uh, and, oh, one thing I did want to wa- remind you of is, and I'll tell you this again on Tuesday, and then this instruction will also be on the test, but um, on those problems where you're just asked to differentiate a function, so you're given a function and then just said, find the derivative, or maybe it's the second derivative. Um, on the test, you're going to have to be very careful to write out your steps um, to finding the derivative. So that doesn't mean you have to write, you know, mind-numbing detail, but you do have to write a, a careful series of steps, um, uh, unless the function is just extremely simple, uh, you know, a series of steps to get from the original function to the derivative, right, so that I can, I can follow your work. 
Um, that's just to make so I can make sure you're doing the steps correctly. And then but that also gives me an opportunity to uh, give you uh, partial credit as well. So um, because there's, you know, plenty of opportunities to make mistakes somewhere in those steps. So so that's really careful. That's really important on the differentiation problems uh, to make sure that you are writing down your steps. So it's not going to be enough for for most of the problems. Almost all the problems not going to be enough just to uh, write down the answer. Right. OK, because um, I, I'm going to count off for that for sure. Right. So um, uh, so there's your first warning about that. And I'll, I'll mention that again on Tuesday and, uh, uh, you know, before you take the test. And that instruction will also be uh, on the test as well. OK. Um, all right. Um, OK, so uh, let, let's just uh, get into the notes here and. Uh, and see if we can uh, finish our uh, introduction to uh, limits. Oh, well, if, if, but do you have any questions about the uh, implicit differentiation homework? So I should ask about that since that's on the test. So um, I'm not sure how, how much you've had, if you've had an opportunity to work on this yet, but if you have, if you have any questions, um, here's your opportunity. Questions about that? Okay, um, well, we, well, we finished our examples with implicit differentiation, so uh, we're done looking at that. Um, and so today we're going to uh, shift gears just a little bit. We're going to revisit a topic that uh, we'd already uh, uh, loosely uh, discussed, uh, but but now we're going to talk about it a little bit more formally, uh, and that's the notion of computing limits. So um, let me bring up the because this is an important process in calculus and. Uh, we did it sort of casually uh, uh, before, but um, uh, now we, we want to go back and talk about it a little bit more uh, carefully. So, so this is not, uh, we're not going to be computing a lot of derivatives today. I know we've been doing that for several weeks, but um, uh, uh, that's not what we're, we're doing something a little bit different today. So that, that might be a little bit refreshing, uh, although it's related to differentiation of course, because um, well, this is calculus, right? Um, all right. So uh, remember, in uh, when we were um, uh, 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 defining derivatives at first, right? Remember, uh, this was this is the definition for how you find a uh, derivative function, right? Remember, you have to take a limit as this value h, which we called the increment, approaches zero of this uh, of this um, average rate of change. Remember, this is really an average rate of change. Uh, uh, quotient, and and then we took the limit of this quotient as this increment h approached zero, and uh, that limit, uh, uh, that is uh, the definition. That's how we derive the uh, derivative function. Uh, that's before we learned all of our nice uh, shortcut rules for uh, uh, computing derivatives, right? Okay, uh, so this is the uh, this is the lengthy process for. Uh, finding a derivative function, you will have a problem where you have to use this limit process, one or two problems like this on the test. There's one problem on the sample test where you have to use this uh, limit process to uh, find a derivative function. It's, it's a derivative function that you can find easily using the shortcut rules. Uh, uh, so you, you, you're going to know what the answer is going to be. But, uh, but in that problem, it asks you ex explicitly to uh, go through this uh, process, okay? So in this process, you have to evaluate, again, what's known as a, uh, a limit, right? Okay, we, we are trying to figure out uh, uh, what uh, a value does this quotient approach as uh, this uh, increment h uh, gets close to zero. Um, now, again, this process, though, occurs frequently in, in calculus, so computing limits occurs frequently in calculus in other contexts as well, besides just um, uh, finding uh, derivatives. And so today we want to talk about this process a little bit more uh, carefully and how we uh, uh, find or evaluate limits. Okay, uh, so let's look at um, let's look at an example and. Um, uh, uh, just to sort of uh, discuss what we mean by, again, by uh, uh, computing a limit, all right? So um, I'm looking at this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, situation, all right? So in, in this problem, 
we're trying to estimate uh, uh, or uh, hopefully we can figure it out exactly, but uh, I mean, at first just estimate uh, what is the uh, 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 limit of this quantity as this variable X approaches zero, All right? That's what that uh, notation means. Um, all right, so again, uh, what we're thinking of is as the as the variable x as we start uh, substituting values for x that are closer and closer to zero, that would be smaller and smaller um, uh, uh, values for x into this quotient. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, value does this quotient approach? Okay, so as x gets closer to zero could be positive or negative close to zero, but as X gets uh, very, very close to zero, so as X uh, gets a, a smaller and smaller, a tinier and tinier number closer to zero, uh, uh, what uh, value would this fraction approach, okay? So uh, uh, maybe there is a value that it's approaching or maybe there's not, okay? Now, um, there's, a, there's a great temptation uh, when you're trying to evaluate limits to just say, well, um, I'm just going to, I would just take the value zero that X, uh, that's the value that X is approaching, right? So let's just take the number zero and um, let's just plug it into this formula for X and let's see what the, let's see what the result is, right? Okay. Uh, surely that should be the, uh, 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 whatever I get when I plug zero in for X into this uh, fraction surely that will be the number that uh, this fraction is approaching as X gets closer and closer to zero, right? Okay. And I mean, that makes kind of intuitive sense. Unfortunately, our intuition in that case uh, is, it doesn't help us because when you plug uh, zero in for X into this fraction, notice what happens. You get zero, of course, in the top over the square root of zero plus one, minus one. Well, the square root of zero plus one is one, and one minus one is going to give you zero. So notice you're going to end up with zero divided by zero, and zero divided by zero is undefined, okay? So you cannot try to evaluate this limit just by plugging uh, the, uh, the, the, this uh, limit value zero in for x, okay? All right, it just doesn't work in uh, this case. Now, um, we might immediately assume then, uh, well, um, that means uh, this limit doesn't exist, okay? So uh, there is no uh, a value that this uh, fraction approaches as X gets closer and closer to zero. Um, but that doesn't turn out to be true either, okay? So uh, there's a second situation where our, intu when our intuition uh, fails us, okay? All right, so uh, hmm, how, am I gonna, uh, how am I gonna approach actually this problem of estimating uh, what this uh, limit actually is. Well, we're just going to have to do it at this point, since we don't have any other tools, we're going to have to just do this experimentally. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to, uh, and we, we've sort of carried out this experiment before, um, I'm going to actually uh, substitute some uh, values for X into this formula, and I'm going to uh, uh, substitute several values for X into the formula, and I'm going to pick values that are closer and closer to zero. And I'm going to see if there's some uh, 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 quantity that this uh, fraction approaches as I substitute smaller and smaller values for X. So we're actually gonna kind of carry out this uh, limit process experimentally. Now that, that involves a lot of arithmetic, right? So uh, that's gonna be kind of uh, ugly to do by hand. So I'm gonna have the, uh, we're gonna have Desmos help us with this, okay? So what I've done here in Desmos is I've typed in this formula um, x over the square root of x plus one minus one. And, um, and Desmos is really good at doing calculations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, 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 substituting smaller and smaller uh, values for x, values for x that are closer and closer to zero. And I'm going to see what I get, okay? Um, so there is what I get when I plugged one in for x. I got about 2.2. Uh, 414, right? Okay. But um, remember, I'm interested in knowing what happens as X approaches zero. And, um, you know, one is kind of close to zero, but it's not really close to zero, right? So let's pick uh, numbers that are closer and closer to uh, uh, zero here. Uh, Y'all want to uh, suggest some for me? 
So what's the value for x that's closer to zero than one? 0.5. Uh, what'd you say there, 0.1? Point, sure, 0.1. Okay, yeah, let's try 0.1. All right, so that's pretty close to uh, one. And um, notice there, Donna, we get there 2.04, okay? So make a note of that. Uh, uh, when uh, x is 0.1, we get 2.04, uh, okay? All right, well, let's try something that's even closer uh, to zero, okay? So maybe um, 0 0.01, but 0 0.1, let's try 0 0.01. Let's make it negative because um, uh, uh, the X value could be negative. Uh, it, it has to be close to zero. And uh, there we get, uh, notice Donna, there we get uh, 1.99, okay? Let's try another one here. Uh, let's make it minus 0 0.001. So see, that's getting closer and closer to zero, right? And notice now the a value of this fraction is 1.999. Uh, let's, well, let's add on another zero here, okay? And now we get 1.9999, right? And let's add, throw in yet another zero there, even closer to uh, zero, and we get one point. How many nines is that? Nine, 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 and then a five, okay? Um, well, it's it, it's kind of obvious here uh, what this limit is, right? From carrying out the experiment, we're not certain of it, but what does it look like this uh, limit is gonna be? As X is getting close to zero, right? What does it look like this, um, what does it look like this fraction is going to get closer to? What, what were those, what were these, uh, uh, what were these uh, uh, values getting close to as we uh, let uh, uh, these uh, X values get closer to zero? Did someone type it for me? <laughs> or tell me? They're it's pretty clear. What, two. what, what? They're getting closer to two. Yeah, sure, right. Getting closer to two, right. Yeah, you pl plugging in smaller and smaller values for X there, right, was just giving us uh, values there closer to, we can plug in another zero there. See, now we're getting just really, really close to uh, the number two. So it appears, right, that this limit here is two, right? Okay, as um, as X gets uh, uh, closer and closer to zero, this fraction is getting closer and closer to uh, two. Notice now, again, it's very important to notice, you cannot, you cannot let X be zero, because if you let X be zero, you wound up getting, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a mystery here, right? If you let X be zero, you get zero over zero, which is undefined. But if you let X be numbers that are very, very close to zero, but not quite zero, you end up getting uh, 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 values for this fraction, which are not undefined, but very, very close to uh, two, okay? So uh, this limit, we, would, we think this limit is uh, two. All right. Now we did that. Uh, uh, we had to do that kind of experimentally, right? But by actually plugging in values for X, you know, in the long run, we don't want to be plugging in values for X to try to figure out what these limits are, right? That involves too much arithmetic. So we want to figure out how we can uh, figure out what this limit is, right? Without doing all this arithmetic. Okay. But at this point, uh, we don't quite know yet. Uh, let me show you the graph, yo. The, here's the graph of this. Um, you can actually uh, tell pretty clearly from the graph uh, what's happening uh, in this. So let me blow the graph up a little bit. Okay. So this is the graph of uh, x over a uh, square root of x plus one minus one. Okay. And notice here on the graph, we were wondering, right, what is happening to our, our output value? What's happening to our y value when we choose x values that are close to zero, right? Okay. And you can see pretty clearly from the graph, right? As you pick X values that are close to zero, here's X equals zero, right? When you pick X values that are close to zero, notice the Y values are getting very close to two, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, looking at the graph, it's very clear, right? Uh, uh, as X gets close to zero, the Y value, which is the value of this fraction, the y value has to be getting close to uh, two. But this graph is, is, is deceptive because you cannot let x actually be zero. Again, because when you plug zero in for x, you get undefined. So 
what's on this graph that you cannot see here because Desmos can't draw it for you, but what do you really have here in this uh, graph that is kind of invisible to you, but you know is there? Right here at this point, what do you have in that graph? Anybody make a guess for me there? So you cannot let X be, you cannot let X be zero because when you plug zero in for X, this turns out to be undefined, okay? So that means this graph actually doesn't include X equals zero. It doesn't have a point where X equals zero. So although you can't see it here on Desmos, you have a hole in the graph right here where X equals zero. There's a missing point on uh, this graph uh, where x equal zero. So um, what does that tell you about this function then uh, when x equals zero? What do you know about the function? The function is not what? If it has a hole in it, that means it's not what? What's the word that we would use there? Calvin, are you? What's the, what's the calculus no, word no, there? I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Calvin, uh, uh, we have a hole in the graph right here uh, at okay. this point where X equals zero. You can't see it, of course. Desmos can't uh, uh, draw okay. that for you, right? But it, you cannot let X be zero. There is no point on this graph where X is zero. So you really have a hole in the graph right here where X is zero. So uh, if you have a hole in the graph where X is zero, what does that mean? That, that means the function here that we're graphing is not, what's the word? Not... Uh um i can't think of the word right now <laughs> yeah can someone uh, else uh, help calvin there with uh, that uh, terminology what's the word there it's one of our it's one of our important concepts in calculus so uh, uh, in in calculus we have you know the idea of direction increasing decreasing we have the idea of uh, concavity right okay and what was the third uh, thing there that was um uh uh, uh the, uh, an important idea for functions in calculus and and this function doesn't have that property right here where x equal zero everyone's forgotten that yeah it's continuous so this function is not continuous at uh, uh, this function is not continuous at x equals zero, okay? Because there's a hole there in the, uh, there's a hole there in the graph um, uh, at x equals zero, all right? Well, we're getting, we're gonna get back here soon to the idea of um, a continuity, okay? Because that is an important idea in helping us evaluate limits. Um, uh, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, shortly. All right, let's try another one now. So that's pretty easy, right, to go through, especially when you have uh, uh, Desmos. So here's the here's that graph that I just showed you, uh, copied into the notes there. So let's try this one, all right, just experimentally. So let's see if we can estimate what the limit is as x approaches two, right? You you can you can let x approach different numbers. It doesn't have to be zero, all right. So here we're interested in. Uh, what's the limit as x approaches two of this uh, fraction? Okay, so um, so if I plug in uh, values for x into this fraction that are closer and closer to two, um, uh, what value does this fraction approach, if any? Okay, uh, maybe uh, it doesn't really approach a value at all. All right. Um, now again, uh, what you might be tempted to do here is to uh, uh, try to uh, uh, you know. Uh, make this easy on yourself by just plugging in two for X into this formula, okay? So uh, that's what students are often tempted to do is to take a shortcut here and say, oh, I can figure out this limit. I'll just plug two in for X into this uh, formula. And here's another case where that's not gonna work, okay? Uh, um, uh, that uh, a shortcut's not gonna work because when you plug uh, two in for X into this fraction, what happens on the bottom? It becomes zero. It becomes zero, right? Okay. And you cannot divide by zero, Colin, right? So um, 
So you cannot plug the number two into this uh, fraction to try to figure out what this um, to try to figure out what this limit is. Okay, so that's unfortunate in this case. Um, uh, that does not mean though that uh, the limit does not exist. All right. So when when you're evaluating a limit, uh, and and this is a subtle point, but it's important. What we're trying to think of is uh, what's happening to this quantity as x gets close to two, but does not actually have to equal two, all right? So as X is getting progressively closer to two, but without touching two, what's happening to this uh, uh, quantity, okay? Um, all right, so again, uh, I don't have any really tools for uh, uh, understanding uh, this limit yet, all right? Then uh, we'll just have to try this experimentally. So let's go back to, uh, and, but we can do this really quickly in uh, Desmos. So. Let me go back and find this. Uh, I think it's this one. Uh, there it is, right? So x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x minus 2. And we're trying to figure out what happens here to this quantity as x gets close to 2. Here's 2 on the x-axis. So what's happening to this quantity as x gets close to 2? You can already see it there, Colin, on the graph, right? As x is getting close to 2, what is the uh, quantity getting close to here? What is the graph getting close to as X gets close to two? Looks like it's getting close to what? So one. one, yeah, right, okay. So you can, you can see from this point on the graph, right, okay, that um, uh, the answer here just has to be one, right, okay? Uh, it looks like it's, um, looks like it's gotta be one. Again, this function is not continuous though, this function is not continuous at x equals two. There's a hole in the graph, you cannot see it. So it's, of course, it's infinitesimally small. So you need a, a, a infinitesimally powerful microscope, right? Uh, to look at this piece of the graph and see that hole in the graph. Uh, but uh, there's a hole in the graph here at x equals two, because again, when you plug two in for x, you get undefined, right? Okay, so this graph skips over x equals two. But as x gets close to two, indeed, it looks like uh, the uh, the uh, y values are getting close to one, and you can check that very easily, right, uh, in Desmos, just by doing the same process that we uh, tried on the earlier one, right? Just pick some numbers that are close to two, and um, and see what you get, right? Let's try uh, one point nine. That's close to two, and uh, we get point uh, zero nine, right? Uh, well, let's keep it even closer to two. So let's try one point nine nine, and uh, notice then. Uh, we get 0.99, right? Closer to one, right? 1.999. There, uh, the uh, 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 the fraction value is 0.999, right? So it looks like every time I add another nine on here and get closer to uh, 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 two, right? It looks like uh, this uh, as x getting closer to two. It looks like this uh, fraction value is getting closer to um, one. Okay. All right, so um, so I think we sort of confirmed there, right? Looks like the uh, uh, looks like this limit is uh, one, right? Um, now it, this this graph is interesting though. When we graph this formula, when we graph this formula, notice we got a straight line, and that's a little bit not what I not what you would expect, right? because that is certainly not the formula for a straight line, correct? So um, how is it that the graph turned out to be a straight line? What's going on here in this fraction so that the graph turns out to be a, a straight line? We're gonna look at that more carefully uh, a little bit later, all right? Um, all right, let's try another one. Uh, actually, a couple more. I wanna show you these. Uh, um, uh, because these are very famous limits in calculus, all right? So uh, these are two limits that uh, are really important to calculus. And um, so here's one of them. Uh, the limit as X gets close to zero of this fraction, sine X divided by X, all right? Um, this limit comes up when you are trying to prove that the derivative of the sine is the cosine, okay? So uh, that's kind of a lengthy process to try to show that the uh, derivative of the sine is the cosine. Of course, we know that now, right? But, um, uh, but when you are trying to uh, 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 show that, uh, this particular limit 
uh, shows up. Okay. And, um, and so let's see what this, let's see if we can figure out what this limit is. So as X gets close to zero, what is sine X over X getting close to? Now, again, uh, you're not going to be able to figure this out just by plugging zero in for X. If we could just figure out this limit by plugging zero in for X, then this would all be easy and uh, this wouldn't be interesting at all. But if you plug zero in for X, you get, of course, sine of zero divided by zero. And, um, you know, you can't divide by zero. And uh, this is even worse because sine of zero is also zero. So you have zero divided by zero, all right? Uh, zero divided by zero is not equal to one, okay? Um, uh, zero divided by zero is undefined. All right, so um, not going to be able to evaluate this limit, unfortunately, just by plugging zero in for x. Um, so let's try to uh, just experimentally figure out what this limit is. And it turns out to have a nice value. It's not um, hard, okay? So um, there's the graph of sine x divided by x. So you can see it's got this uh, sine curvature to it. It's not quite the sine curve, right? Because it's sine x divided by x. There it is. And it certainly looks like, right, as x approaches zero, certainly does look like as x approaches zero, it looks like sine x divided by x is getting close to what? What is that y value right there? Can you all read that? This is zero and this is two. One. So one. Yeah. Is it one? Okay. Yeah, it's one. So um, it looks like, uh, 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 according to the graph, right, as uh, x gets close to zero, looks like sine x divided by x, which is this graph, is getting close to one. But remember, there's a hole in the graph right here, which we cannot see. Uh, this, this, uh, this function is actually discontinuous at x equals zero, okay? Um, so it certainly looks like the answer here is, um, is one, okay? Even though zero divided by zero uh, uh, is undefined. In this case, it does turn out to be one. All right. Um, let's let's plug a few values in for x though, and um, see what we get. So, um, and of course, we're going to get one, but let's just verify that. So, uh, at one, I can't see it over here. It looks like um, when you plug one in for x, you get sine of one divided by one, which is apparently 0.84. So let's take something a little bit closer to zero. Let's try 0.1. And um, so there we get 0 0.99. Let's try 0 0.01. And there we get 0 0.9998. Oops. Let's try 0 0.001. And there we get even more nines, right? 0 0.9999833, right? So it surely looks like, right, that as you plug value, uh, values in for x that are closer and closer to zero here into this uh, fraction, you're going to be getting uh, numbers that are closer and closer to uh, one, okay? And that is, in fact, uh, 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 correct, right? This limit is uh, one. Ah, so um, uh, um, that's a famous limit from calculus. And here's another, uh, it, this one's really unusual, another famous limit from uh, calculus, okay? Um, so it has a really strange uh, uh, formula here for it. So we want the limit, we want to figure out what's the limit as x approaches zero again. Um, we have a lot of cases where we're taking limits where x approaches zero, but you can take limits where, where x is approaching other numbers as well, all right? Um, so uh, we want to know, uh, as we let uh, x get closer and closer to zero in this formula, in this formula, um, uh, what value uh, will we get? All right. Um, now, again, you it's very tempting here to just try to plug zero in for x, right, into the formula to figure out what this limit is. But unfortunately, of course, uh, that doesn't work because uh, uh, this exponent is one over, uh, this exponent is one over X. So uh, that's one divided by zero if you plug zero in for X. And so um, uh, the formula isn't defined 
uh, this formula uh, isn't defined when x is equal to uh, zero. Okay. Um, let's let's look at that formula though, uh, so we can understand it a little bit better for uh, uh, certain values of x. So let's start with uh, if x is equal to 0. 0.5. So uh, uh, that's one half, which is you know that's kind of close to zero, right? So if you let x equal 0. 0.5 and you plug 0. 0.5 into this um, formula, right? You're going to get um, uh, uh, one plus 0. 0.5, right? If x is 0. 0.5, and then uh, you have one divided by 0. 0.5. That's one divided by a half, which is two. So you end up with uh, 1.5 squared, okay? Um, uh, all right, so that's about 2.25. Uh, Actually, it's exactly uh, 2.25. Uh, now, but but look what, uh, what makes this limit hard is when you start, look what happens when you start picking smaller values for X. So say you let X be 0.1 in this uh, formula. So that's uh, certainly a lot closer to zero than uh, 0.5 is, right? So if we let X be 0.1, plug that into this formula, you get one plus 0.1, one plus X, right? So that's 1.1. But notice what's happening to the exponent here. You get one divided by 0.1, which is 10. So uh, notice that when X is getting smaller, closer to zero, the quantity inside the parentheses is getting closer to one, but the exponent is getting big, all right? So when, um, when X is 0.1, um, you have this base 1.1, but your exponent gets much larger, 10. Now, normally when you raise numbers to higher powers, you get very large numbers, right? The only uh, exception to that is if you raise one to a power, one to any power is still one. So you can raise one to the million power and you would still get one, correct? So, um, so notice <laughs> what's happening in this, in this formula is the base is getting closer to one, but the exponent is getting bigger and bigger. So uh, it looks like you're taking uh, uh, numbers closer and closer to one, and but you're that normally when you take a number uh, close to one and raise it to a power, you just get one. But here we're making the powers bigger and bigger. So it's really confusing uh, uh, kind of, uh, 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 you know, what's gonna happen here, right? The base is closer to one. So the power should be closer to one. But the uh, 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 but the uh, exponent here is getting really large, and you know normally when you have really large exponents, you get really large numbers. So there's kind of a race here uh, uh, between you know the the base getting closer to one and the exponent getting larger. You know what's going to happen uh, in that case? That's why that's what makes this limit such a mystery. Um, if you let x be a uh, 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 point zero one, then notice the base becomes 1.01, that's a number very close to one, but the uh, uh, exponent here is one divided by 0 0.01, which is 100. So you get a very large exponent. So it's, you're, it's hard to figure out, is this gonna be a large number because the exponent is large, or is this gonna be a small number because the base is close to one and you can raise one to any power and still get one. So that's what makes this limit so uh, mysterious. Let's uh, let's actually experiment with this a little bit and see what we uh, see what we actually get. Okay, so wow, there's the graph of that expression. Hmm. So um, it, we get a really nice graph, not not confusing at all. And you might think when you graph this, you get a really weird graph, but you don't. You get this nice uh, 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 curve here, not complicated curve at all. Here's x equals zero, and notice, whoops, there it is. You do have a, um, it looks like you do have a limit here, right? As x gets closer to zero, it does look like your y values are getting closer to some number. It's hard to tell what this number is, though, right? Uh, it's somewhere between two and three. A little bit more than uh, a little bit more than two and a half, but not quite up to three. 
So I wonder what that um, I wonder what that number is. Well, let's plug in some um, let's plug in some values for uh, 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 x here and um, see what this is. So let's try 0.1. That's kind of close to zero. So we get uh, 2.59. So when you plug 0.1 in for x and uh, do this arithmetic, you get uh, 2.59. Okay, that's not a bad number. Let's try 0 0.01. And there you have hmm, 2.7. Uh, Let's try 0 0.001. And there I get 2.716. Hmm, Let's try 0 0.001. There I get 2.718. So we do have a limit here, right? It's something close to 2.71. Hard to know though exactly what that number is. There we have 2.718. So it's close to 2.718, right? Let's try one extra zero here. Now we have 2.7182. So some, so we know our a lim, it looks like our limit does exist, right? We can see that from the graph and it's somewhere around the number 2.718, right? So, um, well, let's try that as our, let's try that as our estimate. So I think from using Desmos, it looks like this limit exists and it looks like it's about, not exactly, but close to uh, 2.718. Does anybody know a number, a famous number that's close to um, 2.718? Does that um, does that number ring a bell to anyone? It's not pi. Pi is 3.14, so that's not pi. But is there any other uh, famous number that is approximately 2.718? It's E. It's E. That's correct. Right. And that's exactly what this limit is. So this limit when you uh, uh, evaluate exactly turns out to be the very famous irrational number e okay so that is one way of defining the irrational number that we label as e right okay uh is uh, by using this uh limit okay uh the limit of this quantity is uh exactly e one can prove that uh, this irrational number E, which is approximately 2.718, okay? Uh, it's an irrational number, though, so it actually has an infinitely long decimal expansion that doesn't repeat, okay? But that's the first three decimal places of the, that's the first three decimal places of the number E, okay? So, um, so that limit results in, um, that limit results in the number E, all right? Um, okay, well, so, uh, so there are some examples of, uh, you know, just computing limits uh, uh, experimentally, informally, right, or estimating them. Um, let's go back and see if we can uh, determine some limits analytically, though, without using, um, without having to just uh, uh, guess at them, okay, or estimate them. We're not guessing at them, but estimate them using um, Desmos, all right? So, uh, so we're going to learn some tricks here for actually uh, evaluating limits, uh, uh, without having to do a bunch of computations, all right? Um, uh, so let's start with this one. Uh, uh, I think we, I forgot what we discovered this was a moment ago, okay? But this is one that we, uh, let's look. This is one that we had already uh, estimated by looking at the, this is one that we'd already estimated by looking at the graph. What was that one? That's up here. Oh, it turned out to be one, okay? So, um, so we had already uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, figured out that this limit uh, has to be one, and so let's see if we can uh, let's see if we can figure this out without um, uh, Desmos. All right. Um, well, here's the uh, uh, we get a lucky break here that allows us to evaluate this particular limit because it turns out just by luck that the numerator of this uh, fraction will factor. So x squared minus 3x plus 2 will actually factor. And that factors as uh, x minus 2 times x minus 1. So uh, you can check that. Uh, x squared minus 3x plus 2 is actually uh, x minus 2 times x minus 1. And that's really convenient in this case because the denominator here is 
obviously also x minus two. So you can really, in this expression, divide out the x minus twos. And so this limit is really the limit as x approaches two of this quantity, x minus one, okay? Well, it's pretty obvious here, you don't have to do any uh, uh, estimating with decimals. Um, as x approaches two, right, in this uh, uh, quantity, x minus one, it's obvious that that uh, uh, quantity is gonna approach what? Lance. So as X appro is approaching two, then what's X minus one gotta be getting close to? Going to one, right? Yeah, it's gotta be getting close to two minus one, right? Okay, as X is getting closer to two, right? Then X minus one has gotta be getting closer to two minus one, right? In other words, in this, uh, uh, in this limit, you can evaluate the limit just by substituting uh, uh, two for X, okay? Because um, two minus one is not undefined, right? Okay, uh, that's very easy to compute. And of course it turns out to be one. So this very simple limit, the limit as X approaches two of X minus one, that one you can determine just by substituting uh, uh, the limit value for X. And so we can see that, uh, oh yeah, this limit must be, uh, two minus one, which is one, which is what we had already uh, seen that it was going to be, right? Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, that limit looked that looked very difficult to calculate a moment ago. Actually, we can do it intuitively. We can evaluate it by inspection. We just had to notice that oh, this fraction reduces, okay, um, uh, to uh, an expression that's much easier uh, to determine uh, the limit for. All right, this one's not, this is also, we figured out this li limit a moment ago, right? I forgot already what it was. What was that? Um, that's the first example that we looked at. What was that? Uh, what was that limit? So that's this one. And uh, looks like that one turned out to be two, right? Okay, so, um, so we had already uh, figured out that, um, this ugly limit has to be two, just experimentally. All right, let me show you how we can, uh, let me show you how we can uh, uh, play with this expression algebraically so that we can figure out what this um, actual limit is gonna be, all right? But I'm gonna say that, uh, that does involve a little bit of algebra. So I'm gonna save that for after the break. So let's take a few minutes break here. We'll come back after 12.30 in about five or six minutes or so, and I'll show you um, um, how you can uh, determine this limit. Uh, you really have to be shown how to determine this limit. It's not something that's obvious, okay? But, um, but we can uh, uh, determine this limit uh, analytically with pencil and paper. And that's kind of our goal here is to uh, uh, see examples and learn some tricks that we can use to determine limits analytically without having to uh, uh, experiment. Okay. Um, all right. So let's come back in a few minutes and we'll look at that um, example. I'm going to pause the recording now. Okay. We're back. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to show you how to uh, uh, figure out that this uh, uh, limit, the limit as X approaches zero of this quantity is two actually, although we've already convinced ourselves of that from um, looking at Desmos. Um, this example, you're probably not going to like too much because uh, it involves a little bit of an algebraic trick that you have to be shown. Um, and uh, it makes it look like evaluating limits is more complicated than it really is, okay? Um, we're going to learn uh, 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 shortly here uh, that uh, if this uh, function if you think of this expression as a function, if this function is continuous, uh, then it, that makes uh, evaluating limits much easier. Okay, and so um, and so um, it, it, it typically it won't be as uh, uh, hard to evaluate limits as uh, this particular uh, example is. Um, but let me show you what we can do here anyway. So. Um, um, 
what I'm going to do is I, I'm, I'm going to pull a little trick here. I'm going to multiply the uh, top and bottom of this um, fraction uh, by a particular um, quantity. So see what I'm doing. This is the this is the uh, uh, that's the fraction that I'm trying to take the limit of. But I'm going to multiply top and bottom by uh, uh, almost the same as the denominator. But uh, uh, instead of uh, having a, a minus here, I'm going to have a plus. Okay. So I'm going to multiply by uh, square root of x uh, uh, plus one plus one in into the bottom. But I'm also going to do that into the top as well. OK, um, because I, I have to make sure I'm not changing the value of this fraction. So what I'm really multiplying here by is one because you have uh, this quantity divided by itself. So you're really multiplying this fraction by one. So you're not changing the value of this fraction, but we're going to make it look um, we're going to make it look different. Um, and uh, so let's see. Uh, let, let's see why this trick is uh, kind of helpful here, right? So um, let's multiply these numerators together. Well, I have to multiply x by, you know, uh, uh, these two terms. So I get x times the square root of x plus 1 and then uh, plus um, x, right? Okay. And um, let's see what's let's see what happens in the let's see what happens in the denominator here. I may I I, I probably should have left that in uh, that that uh, product in the numerator. I probably should have left that in factored form, but uh, that's okay. We'll deal with that later. Now in the bottom, uh, so we're multiplying um, these denominators together, right? So. Let's see what that ends up. Uh, uh, let's see what that ends up looking like. We have to do the uh, we have to do the uh, uh, the multiplication here really carefully. So we have square root of x plus one times the square root of x plus one. We're going to multiply these two terms together first. Well, uh, those are just uh, square roots of the same quantity you're multiplying together, right? Square root of x plus one times square root of x plus one. So that's going to give you just x plus one without the square root, correct? That's like saying square root of two times the square root of two is two. Well, square root of x plus one times the square root of x plus one is just going to be x plus one. Now let's take square root of x plus one times one. So this square root times this one. Well, that's just going to be one times the square root of x plus one. And then we take the minus one and multiply it by square root of x plus one. So that gives us very conveniently minus the square root of uh, x plus one, right? And that's perfect because those two square roots are gonna cancel each other, right? And then minus one uh, times plus one is minus one. Oh, wow. So that denominator now is going to simplify beautifully. That was why I multiplied the denominator by this uh, square root of x plus one plus one uh, uh, because I knew that when I took this product, uh, this product was going to simplify very nicely. So the numerator doesn't really simplify nicely, right? But the denominator simplifies beautifully because the square root of x plus ones, they cancel each other. So I don't end up with any square roots in the bottom. And then I have a plus one and a minus one. So those cancel each other. So, wow, this really simplifies to... Uh, 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 this really simplifies the denominator to something very easy, right? Um, we just get x. Now in the top, I still have a, a kind of a mess there. I have x times the square root of x plus one and then plus x. But because that denominator has simplified to just x, now I can divide that x out. I can divide this x out with this and this x also out with this one. So that leaves me with a uh, limit as x approaches zero of uh, square root of x plus one plus 
one, all right? These x's divide out, so you get left with square root of x plus one, and then uh, x over x is one. So all of that big fraction that was um, really messy, that all reduces to just uh, a square root of x plus one plus one. And now we're thinking, hmm, what is the limit as x approaches zero of this expression? But that is much easier to figure out, right? As x is getting closer and closer to zero, in this expression, it looks like you just must have the square root of zero plus one plus one, right? As x gets closer to zero, then this square root must be getting closer to the square root of zero plus one. Of course, you just have this plus one added on at the end. Ah, so, well, what is the square root of zero plus one? Someone, did y'all come back? Isn't it plus or minus one? Um, well, it, yeah, no, if you, uh, Colin, if you said, um, if you had uh, x uh, squared is equal to one, then x would be plus or minus one, right? But here we started with just the positive square root. So we don't have to worry about the negative square root. Oh. So what is just the positive square root of zero plus one? one? One, right? So you get one plus one here, which is two, exactly what we knew it was going to be, right? So, um, so there's how we could figure out that limit without having to actually plug in any values. Um, in a way, we are plugging in values. We're sort of doing it mentally. We're thinking, oh, uh, uh, if I uh, substitute values that are closer and closer to zero into this square root, this square root is just going to get closer and closer to the square root of zero plus one. I can do that in my imagination, right? I don't have to actually uh, plug in values for x and compute them, right? I can in, uh, just by inspection figure out what that's going to be. And, um, and there we get it, right? The, the answer is uh, two. You cannot do that, however, you cannot do that same sort of inspection process back with the original fraction because, again, when you uh, uh, plug in, uh, when you think about uh, uh, plugging in zero for x here, you get a you get divided by zero, right? And so, um, so you can't evaluate this fraction just by substituting uh, uh, zero for x. But this expression you can evaluate just by substituting zero for x. Uh, okay. So well, so uh, uh, so we can evaluate this limit analytically. Uh, 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 just with pencil and paper, but it does involve this trick, and that's a trick that you're not gonna, you're not gonna see that trick uh, to do that trick right unless somebody shows it to you right. Okay, so someone figured this out uh, a long time ago that that trick works. Um, who knows, right? Uh, who that was? Um, um, but. Um, It's something that does require, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, insight. All right, uh, let's look at uh, some uh, uh, evaluating limits uh, just from uh, uh, looking at graphs, because you can also evaluate limits looking at graphs. Okay, and that's and we did that in uh, uh, some of those earlier examples, and it's a really convenient tool sometimes for helping you understand uh, limits. So uh, here we have a. Now, this is a graph of a function called a. And obviously, this is a completely artificial function, right? OK, so I've just uh, uh, drawn this elaborate uh, graph of this function called a just for the purposes of this example. But uh, there it is anyway. So we have a function uh, that I'm calling a. So it's got lots of branches to it. Uh, it's got lots of holes and breaks in it. So it's it's not a continuous function, right? OK. Uh, at all, right? It's got, uh, 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 like I said, lots of uh, uh, different pieces to it. Um, and uh, but let's use that to uh, uh, evaluate uh, some limits. Now, this this part A is not a limit, so this is just a straightforward algebra question. If this if this is the function A, then what is A of minus three? So this is just a matter of looking at the graph and reading the graph, right? So there is minus three on the graph. And so we go up until we hit the graph, which is not here, right? Because we have an open dot. 
So A of minus 3 is actually down here at this point, and it looks like that is 2, correct? So uh, that's easy. A of minus 3 is uh, 2. What about A of 3? Um, here's another place where we have a hole in the graph, right? So A of 3 is not this point, but it's this point down here, which again is uh, appears to be 2. So A of 3 there is uh, 2. So that's easy to evaluate. What about A of 9? Um, I think this is undefined, right? Because we have this uh, 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 vertical asymptote drawn here into the graph at x equals 9. And so I think that um, that vertical dashed line, that's an asymptote, right? I think that means that this curve does not cross over x equals 9. So uh, x equals 9 is not in the domain of this function. So this is undefined. So uh, A is not continuous at 9, right, because there's a break in the graph right there at 9. And um, so the best we can just say there is A of 9 is not defined, right? There is no value for A of 9. Okay, now let's try computing some, now let's try computing some limits. All right, so... Let's think about what is the limit as x approaches 3 of this curve. So as x gets closer and closer to 3, but doesn't touch 3, it doesn't have to touch 3, what is a of x getting closer and closer to? All right, so let's, here's the graph, right? There's x equal 3. So as x is getting closer to 3, you have to look on both sides. So it can be from either direction. As X is getting closer and closer to three, what value is that curve getting closer and closer to? Someone, so as X is getting closer to three, what is the curve getting closer to? Someone, someone tell me there, I can't, I'm not looking at my chats very well here, so. Oh, Donna, yeah, perfect, right? Okay, uh, yeah, you read the graph uh, really nicely there. It's just a matter of reading the graph, right? Uh, uh, as X is getting closer to uh, uh, three, the curve appears to be getting closer to four. I want to point out that is not the same. Look, these two things are not the same. So the limit as X approaches three is four, but A of three actually turns out to be two. OK, because when you're computing a limit, you only care uh, what's happening as X gets closer to the number, but doesn't touch the number. Right. When X actually touches three, the uh, A value turns out to drop down here to two. Right. So A of three is two. But the limit of uh, A as X approaches three actually is this uh, where this open dot is. That is four. So notice these two things do not agree with each other. And sometimes that happens. Um, why does that happen, Donna, that the, the limit as X approaches three and A of three don't agree? Because what what's happening to the function right here at three? There's a break. There's a break. In other words, the function is not what? Conti not continuous. Not continuous, right, okay. It, when it, In situations where a function is not continuous, that is where uh, you have uh, uh, strange things happening with limits, okay? So I um, real quick. Go ahead. Um, that one little dot, uh, three, two, is that part of the graph or is it just- Yeah, that's part of the graph, right? Oh, yeah, that wasn't just a scribble on my part. Okay. That was actually part of the graph, <laughs> yeah, okay? So um, uh, 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 there's a, this uh, a break in the graph here uh, where you have this uh, uh, kind of uh, strange value for the function. Right, okay, um, at three, A of three is actually two, but otherwise uh, uh, a, uh, the function A is up here closer to four, right? And and that, that discrepancy there where the limit of A and the actual output from A don't agree with each other, that is a discontinuity, okay? That results in this, um, uh, this break, right? Let's take a, a kind of look at another uh, example of that. Um, so uh, uh, this is part E. We want the limit as X approaches minus three of A, okay? So what's the limit 
as x approaches minus three. The tricky part is, is you have to look from both sides. So as you look from this side, as you're going to minus three, what is the curve moving up to? Looks to be moving up to what? Five. Five. But, yeah, Van, but on this side, what is the curve moving toward? Two. Two. Notice those do not match, okay? Because the curve doesn't come together there, right? Because you have a, 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 a discontinuity there, right? Okay, the curve is not mm -hmm. continuous here at minus three. So guess what, Van? This limit uh, is undefined. This limit doesn't exist right? Because it doesn't match from both directions, all right? As you, uh, as you move from, uh, 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 toward minus three from the left, uh, it goes up to five. As you move minus three to the right, it goes down to two. So since you don't have the same limit from both directions, we would say that um, the limit is undefined, okay? Let's look at this one. What's the limit as X approach? Where's minus seven? Oh, all right. So as X approaches minus seven, what's happening to the curve? So what's happening on the left as we get close to minus seven? Wow, the curve is falling off to what? What's that dropping off to? What's way down here? Negative oh, infinity. Negative infinity, <laughs> yeah. So the curve is... Uh, 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 dropping off here to minus infinity, okay? But as you move from the uh, uh, right toward minus seven, oh, it's also dropping off to minus uh, infinity. So actually, you can answer this in two ways. You could say this limit is minus infinity. That actually is usually considered appropriate, all right? Um, uh, uh, as again, as x approaches minus seven, uh, uh, the curve is dropping off to minus infinity on the left, and on the right, as x approaches minus seven, the curve is dropping off to minus infinity again. Since both of those are minus infinity, we could say, oh, the limit here is minus infinity, and that would actually be an acceptable answer. But you could also put undefined here because minus infinity is not really a number. Right. Okay. Um, that's not really a real number. So you could also put undefined, but I think either of these are uh, acceptable. Now, uh, because the uh, because the limit when you approach from the left and the limit when you approach from the right may not be the same. Um, sometimes. Uh, uh, we actually like to indicate the limit when we approach from the left or the limit when we approach from the right. And we can do that in calculus by uh, putting a little sup uh, superscript of plus or minus above this limit value. So this minus is not a, a negative sign. This is just a superscript to indicate that we're taking the limit from the negative direction. That is from the left-hand side, okay? So let's think about what this limit is. As X approaches minus three from the left, as X approaches minus three from the left on this curve A, um, what value is the curve approaching? So as we go from to minus three from the left, ah, the curve is going up to what? Five, right? Okay, so this, um, this limit would be uh, five. But if you put a plus sign here, you mean the limit as X approaches from the right-hand side, from the positive direction. So as you approach minus three from the right-hand side, notice the curve is falling off to two. So this uh, 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 limit is uh, two. Those do not agree with each other. And since those don't agree, that's why this limit where you don't put the superscript is undefined. Uh, if you don't put the superscript in the limit value, that means from the left or the right, they have to be the same. And since they're not the same, then that's why this limit is undefined. Um, let's try this one. What about if you approach a nine from the positive uh, direction, from the right-hand side? Scroll up here. 
So as we're going along this curve and we're approaching nine from the uh, uh, right-hand side, it looks like the curve is shooting up to what? There's nine, right? So what's the curve moving up to? What's up here? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. So it looks like this limit from the right is positive infinity. On the other hand, Daniel, as you come in from the left, this is the limit approaching nine from the left, from the negative direction. It looks like this curve is falling off to what? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. So if you just ask altogether, Daniel, what's the limit as X approaches nine? That means from either direction. Well, unfortunately, they don't agree from either direction, right? So you would have to say, Daniel, that this is um, undefined. undefined. Okay. If both of these were negative infinity, you could put minus infinity here. That would be fine. If both of these were positive infinity, you could put positive infinity. That would be fine. But since they don't match, um, you have to say it's undefined. Okay. Um, so we can evaluate limits also from uh, uh, cur uh, from uh, graphs. Sometimes that's uh, convenient to. Uh, sometimes that's convenient to do. Uh, professor. Yes. I have a question on the graph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we say uh, the limits is like uh, when uh, when is when there's a circle, if this is gonna discontinue at that point. Mm -hmm. For example, if we look at D, it discontinues at four. Uh, the circle at, at above. three at three yeah it, it continues uh uh at three so we're gonna look at the number close to four if we look out for the limits or is on top of four like if it's discontinue at four and the y value at four so why we have to choose four or is it the i'm i'm just confused because we say we're gonna choose the limits uh close to that point or is exactly on that point? Yeah, so when uh, so when you're computing this limit as X approaches three, remember it's approaching but not equal to three, okay? So X doesn't actually, in the limit, X doesn't touch three. So notice as X is getting close to three, right? But not touching it. X is getting close to three but not touching it. Notice the curve is going up to four, right? On the same thing, thing on this side, as X is getting close to three from the positive direction, but not touching three, the curve is going also toward four, in this case, going down toward four. But in both directions, the curve is moving toward four. But, but, when, but when you actually touch X equal four, the curve drops off here. But that is irrelevant for the limit. The limit is only when x gets close to, but not exactly equal to this value. Okay, I get it. No, no. Yeah, okay. So you kind of actually, in the limit, you kind of actually no, ignore the limit value itself, okay? That's kind of irrelevant. Um, uh, it's only what's happening as you get very close uh, to that, okay? Now, ideally... The, uh, the, uh, the uh, these two things would agree, all right? So uh, the limit value and the function value would actually be the same. In other words, ideally, this black curve would be up here, right? And it would fill in this dot, okay? Um, when I say ideally, that happens when the function, that's going to happen when the function is continuous, Daniel, okay? When you don't have a break like this, right? But this function, unfortunately, not continuous. Um, okay. Okay, I understand. Here's another example of a function not continuous. All right. So um, let's look at this example. Square root of x over x. Uh, sorry, not square root of x. Absolute value of x over x. And we want to know what's the limit as x approaches 0. Um, if you evaluate... Uh, this uh, function and make a graph of it, um, you get a very simple graph. So if you plug in some values for X, positive and negative values for X, and then uh, calculate this, um, let me show you what you get. You get, um, uh, for negative values of X, you always get uh, minus one. For zero, 
you don't get anything. Uh, 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 it's undefined because you can't divide by zero, right? So when you plug zero into this formula, you get uh, undefined. And then for positive values of x, you get positive one always from this um, from this formula. So when you make the graph, the graph looks like uh, the graph looks like this. Over here on the positive side of the x-axis, you always get one. So it's this horizontal line uh, at x. I'm uh, sorry, at y equals one. And then on the negative side, you always get negative one. So you get a horizontal line like this. And then right at zero, you don't get anything uh, because um, you don't get anything because the um, function is undefined there. So uh, what's this limit going to be there? So what's the limit as x approaches zero of this formula? Uh, when you you can see now when you look at this graph, well. What's the limit from the, uh, 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 as you approach zero from the left-hand side, Daniel, what's the limit from the left-hand side? What are the Y values going to on the left-hand side? They're always what? Yeah, Daniel, can you see that on the left hand side? What's the on the left hand side? What's the limit as X approaches zero? This curve is always stuck at what? Negative one. Negative one. Right. So from the left hand side, the limit is minus one. But from the right hand side, what's the limit going to be? Uh, positive one. Positive one. Those do not agree, unfortunately. So guess what? This limit this limit doesn't exist, right? Because the limit from the left and the limit from the right are not the same, okay? So this limit is undefined. Let me write that down more carefully. So the limit as X approaches zero from the left, that's this side of the curve, um, that turns out to be uh, minus one, okay? But on the other side, the limit as x approaches uh, zero from the positive direction of this uh, formula, that turns out to be positive one. See, on this side, it's positive one. It doesn't matter what's happening right at zero. You have a hole in the graph right here at zero. That's irrelevant, right? You're, you're only interested in what's happening as you get close to zero. But on the left, it's minus one. On the right, it's positive one. Those do not match up. Unfortunately, those do not match up. So this limit is undefined. As you approach from this side, as you approach from this side, you're going to different places. So you don't have a, uh, you don't have a limit. Here's another uh, place where you don't have a limit. Okay, so if you look at um, if you look at uh, one over x minus one, uh, you get a graph that looks like this. Okay, so um, uh, it's got two branches to it, and obviously there's a break in the graph here. There's a, a place where the graph is not continuous right here at x equals one. Because when you plug one into this formula, you get uh, one divided by zero, which is undefined, right? So, so you don't have a, a, a the graph doesn't cross over uh, uh, x equals one. So you have an asymptote here in the graph, right there at x equals uh, one. And uh, when you graph it, you get two branches here: this branch on the left and this branch on the right. When you uh, graph that formula, so if you look at the limits here. Uh, from the left and the right, notice that they're not going to be the same. So if you look at the limit as x approaches 1 from the negative direction, as x approaches 1 from the negative direction, what's happening to this uh, formula, obviously? It's going what's to it dropping off to what? Infinity? Yeah, it's going off to, what would you say, Van? 
negative infinity? Yeah, it's falling off to negative uh, infinity. Okay. You can, you can kind of see that, uh, uh, you can kind of uh, imagine that uh, by doing a little bit of mental arithmetic. Think about what happens if you plug in a number for into this formula, if you plug in a number for X, which is close to one, but a little bit less than one. See, we're coming from the left-hand side. So if you plug in a number that's close to one, but a little bit less than one, you're gonna end up with a negative number in the denominator here, because uh, uh, you, you'll, you'll be, uh, this number is a little bit less than one, you're subtracting one. So you'll have a negative number in the denominator, but, uh, 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 but a very tiny negative number if you let X be very, very close to one, you'll have a very tiny negative number in the denominator that you're dividing into one. So when you divide one by a really small negative number, that gives you a really big um, uh, result, right? Okay. And uh, so that's why uh, the, uh, that's why the uh, curve is falling off to negative infinity here on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, as... Um, X approaches one from the positive direction, kind of the opposite thing is occurring, okay? You'll be dividing by tiny, tiny positive numbers. Well, one divided by a tiny positive number is essentially gonna be positive infinity, right? So the curve is gonna zoom up here to positive infinity as X gets close to one. But those two things are not the same. Negative infinity and positive infinity are not the same. So the curve doesn't uh, uh, go to the same place from either direction, right? So this limit is undefined, okay? If it were uh, falling off to negative infinity on the uh, uh, left and the right, we could say the limit is minus infinity. Or if it were shooting up to positive infinity on the left and the right, we could say the limit is positive infinity. But since uh, uh, these don't match, then there is no limit here, okay? Uh, this limit is um, undefined. All right. Um, well, there's my, uh, uh, there's my introduction to limits, all right? And, uh, but we're not through with limits because um, I promised you that we, we would learn how to evaluate these analytically, uh, you know, just with pencil and paper a little bit better without having to rely on, uh, uh, graphs or, you know, algebraic tricks. And uh, the secret to doing that is to, um, is to make sure you're dealing with uh, continuous functions, okay? Because um, in continuous functions, uh, limits are much easier to evaluate, okay? Because in continuous functions, right, you won't have situations like this, right, okay, occur. Or you won't have situations like this occurring, right? Because these are not, uh, these last two examples are not examples of continuous functions, right? So if, you, if you're limiting yourself to just considering continuous functions, then limits are much easier to, uh, then limits are much easier to evaluate, okay? Um, and so, uh, so it becomes just a matter of recognizing, um, uh, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a continuous function uh, and when you're not dealing with a continuous function. Uh, it, uh, that if you can recognize that, then that can make uh, your uh, evaluating limits uh, easier. Uh, so we're going to talk about that uh, next time. Okay. Um, all right. So none of this is on the test, though, right? So uh, this is all for after the test, and um, and so concentrate on your um, what is it? Uh, implicit differentiation homework, right? Uh, 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 to get ready for the uh, to get ready for the test next time, and 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 the sample. Um, okay, so, uh, well, we're going to, uh, oh, I'm leaving, uh, we have seven minutes early. Wow, how did that happen? I, I messed up there, but, it, so you got seven free minutes today, okay? So use, use that time wisely. Um, you have any other questions that y'all want to ask? So don't forget, Madison has a session Monday at, oh, Madison, I forgot, noon? I think it's Monday at noon, Okay. Uh, is Madison session? Uh, so, if you want to ask questions about the test review, yeah, Monday at noon. You're right. Yeah, Monday. Mm -hmm. at noon. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, guys, I'll see you all on uh, next Tuesday, just prior to uh, the test. Um, if you need to, uh, you can email me too if you have questions. So, uh, if you need to uh, uh, talk with me, just email me, and we can always set up a Zoom time uh, to 
answer questions, okay? Um, I think that's it. Thank you. you have a good weekend, I will, Professor. I will see y'all. I hope the sample test is not too hard. It's kind of long, so, but do the best you can on it. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, all right. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Bye, Madison. Have a good weekend. Thank you.